Hey, what's up you amazing hackers? I hope you're all doing well today. I've got a bit of a treat for you because we're going to talk about my favorite type of vulnerability. And no, it's not cross-site scripting, it's actually IDORs or insecure direct object references. What are they and how do you test for them? So these types of vulnerabilities actually arise from access control issues. We'll devote an entire chapter to those types of vulnerabilities, but the term either was made popular by appearing in the OWASP top 10. In reality, it's simply another type of broken access control issue. IDORs can manifest in both horizontal and vertical privilege escalation. When we talk about privilege escalation, what we mean is that as a typical user, we'll be able to access functionality that we shouldn't normally be able to access, like accessing invoices that do not belong to us, or even accessing invoices when we shouldn't be able to access invoices at all. So to speak of an IDOR, one of actually both of the following conditions have to be met. An object identifier has to exist in the request, either as a get or a post parameter, and a broken access control issue has to exist, allowing the user to access data they should not be able to access. I've got a couple of examples as well for you guys because those terms might seem a little bit abstract. So we have get invoice.php question mark ID equals 12. We have an identifier in there. Or we can make a post request do personal info.php with the body of person ID equals 23 and name equals tester. So there we are editing some names for our users. We also have an example like file names that might also be uh, an IDOR. Like if your file is just get slash invoices slash 1234.txt, you can also make that 1234 into anything. So that might also be an identifier. And in these examples, we can see either a post or a get request being made and both contain an identifier. Well, each three of the examples contain an identifier to be more specific. In a normal situation, the user can only access invoices or personal data that belongs to them. So if you actually change one of those identifiers and you get personal uh, information or you're able to edit information that's not yours, we have an IDOR on our hands. It may seem like a simple interpretation of IDOR, but that's basically the gist of it, guys. It's not as complex as you make it out to be, and it's not as complex as it may seem. However, complexity comes into play when we talk about how to test for these object identifiers or how to, how to automate looking for them. One of the things that a lot of people, a lot of bug bounty hunters will do is they'll look at the domain application, they'll look at each identifier that they can find and they'll test for that. But it's also very important that you look a bit deeper, that you dig deeper and that you go look in the JavaScript files because there might be a JavaScript function that takes an identifier that can get executed or there may be an endpoint that takes an identifier you never know, so it's very important to always go looking a little bit deeper. Now, how do you look for these IDOR vulnerabilities? There are a few basic manual or semi-automatable strategies. I say semi because we cannot fully automate this, at least in my opinion. I say this because IDORs often happen on authenticated parts of a website and crawlers often have difficulty with authenticated requests. That's at least my experience, yours may differ. Manual searching for IDORs is probably the easiest way. In a previous chapter, we went over our main attack strategies. Now in our main attack strategy, just to repeat real quick, we stated that we should explore the website with a man in the middle proxy like burp in the background, capturing all of the requests. Now, why have we talked about this so much? It's because we can do a lot with those requests afterwards. I also have some screenshots for you guys in the description below. There will be a Medium article, so if you guys are interested in that, feel free to follow along. You can click in the proxy, you have an HTTP history tab, and in there you can click the filter bar that's at the top. And if you click it, you can show only the parameterized requests. You can do the same in your target sitemap and if you do that you will have a lot of uh, a lot of an easier time finding requests that contain parameters. 
Um, we will have to go to draw requests manually though and send them to the repeater. Um, and if they contain an identifier, we'll have to edit that identifier, of course. Now, never just take a random identifier. We'll talk about how to test this properly a little bit later. But first, let's talk about some challenges. So say you've been testing your website yesterday and you want to start attacking it today. So you want to try some actual IDOR hunting. There's going to be some issues because if you go and show your parameterized requests in your sitemap, those are going to contain an authentication method like a JWT token, for example, in the authorization header. Um, but that's not going to be valid any longer or your session cookie might be expired. So that's going to mean that if you could just send your requests to the repeater, you're going to get an error back. It's simple as that. You're going to have to replace those broken authentication things with valid ones. So you're going to have to log in again after you've logged in. You're going to have to go to your repeater. So it's a, sorry, I mean, of course, your HTTP history in your proxy tab. And one of the latest requests is going to contain the valid authentication method. So in there, we'll find a proper JWT token or a proper session cookie that we can use. We'll have to copy that into the repeater and then we can take it from there. Now, um, I'll give you guys an example because again, it might seem a little bit abstract. Um, but one thing I want to warn you guys first is be careful, everybody. You guys are bug bounty hunters. You are testing in a live production environment most of the time. Don't just fill in any random identifiers. Don't test with random data. It's not cool to just go and request everybody's data in a production environment. Even if you're a bug bounty hunter, it's important that you create two accounts and that you try to request data from each of those accounts. So an example I can give you guys, say we have a get request to invoice.php with a question mark ID equals 12 parameter. And we send that to the repeater. The request is going to contain a JWT token in the authorization header, but that token is going to be expired. When you launch the request, it will return a 500 error because JWT is expired. Now, what we can do about that is we can log back into the application and check the proxy tab for HTTP history. And one of the latest requests should contain a valid JWT token. Copy that JWT token and replace the expired token in your repeater. You should now get a 200 OK response from the server if you fire the requests. So that gives us a proper request and response. Now what we need to do is create a new account. Log into that account and check the HTTP history in the proxy tab again. It's going to again contain a valid JWT token, but again this time it's going to be from our second user. The user should not be able to see the data that we have in our repeater, but we're going to replace the JWT token anyway. So we're going to re replace the JWT token from user one with the token from user two. And we're going to try and send our request again. And if we get a 200 response and we get valid data back, we actually might have an either if that data is not supposed to be publicly accessible. That's very important. I keep hammering that guys, but it's really important that you know what's impactful for your target and what's not. Now, if you want to semi-automate this, that's possible, of course. We can try Authorize. It's a Burp Pro extension. I have a specific video about that, which I will link to in the description below. Um, now, you can also try something similar because the only thing that authorize is going to do is it's going to resend the request that you send, but with modified authentication headers. So either JWT token or session token or some custom implementation. And it's going to try and send that unauthorized as well. We can do the same thing. We can add a basic match and replace rule. So we can just go to proxy options and there we will see the header match and replace. And we can add a type request header 
which will replace any uh, values in the request header that match what we specify and replace it with our different JWT token. So what I just usually do is I'll match my first user's JWT or session tokens or cookies or whatever, and I'll replace them with the ones from user two. Then you can click around in the application and if you are wanting to access personal identifiable information or private information, you should get an error back. If you don't get an error back, you might have an either on your hands. But again, it has to be private information. And it's also very important that you have set your rule correctly, of course, because you might get okay back on everything and you might get data back there. But if you didn't set your rule properly, that doesn't mean a lot, of course. Um, if you have any trouble with that, feel free to join our Discord as well. We can help you out. There's a help me channel. If you want help, feel free to post in there. Now, as long as this rule is active and you click around, you can expect errors happening all around. Um, if you want to disable it, you can simply uncheck the checkbox. And what I recommend is that you enable it. You just click around a little bit in the application. And then uh, if you're done on that page, you just disable it, go to a different page, enable it again and click around some more. I also have a couple of questions real quick for you guys because my laptop battery is dying. Can you think of other ways to automate IRO hunting? And can you think of other ways to test for IDRs manually? So quite a long video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for sticking with me for so long because it's very important that you know how this works. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, please let me know in the comments below. How do you look for IDORs? There are a thousand and one ways. So I would really like to know how you look for them. Thanks for watching. I'm out. See you later, guys.